Ancestors, help us to heal all disunity within ourselves. Heal the disunity between our masculine and our feminine selves. And the disunity between our thoughts and our actions. What we feel we want versus what we keep making happen in our lives. Help us to heal all discord in our intimate unions, past and present, and to just transform them into sacred unions. Help us by giving us examples and encouragement and understanding wisdom to create and transform and manifest sacred unions throughout our lives with our intimate partners as well as the world around us and help us understand sacred unity to our very core and essence so that all relationships we come to have will be sacred unions. Ashe. So welcome to my room. I tried to put some light on in here, but it's going to be kind of a darker video because it's nighttime and this house isn't super well lit. But I felt like doing the sacred movement portion. I'm like, my husband stepped out to go be with some friends for dinner and my kids are in their room, like winding down for the evening. So it's just kind of me. And so I, oh gosh, yeah, that's why they don't put the light down there. It's like making my eyeballs all dark and so, anyway. So um, I just feel like, you know, doing some mom stuff, dancing. And um, FKA Twigs recently came out with a really beautiful song, which she let Future kind of ruin the end of. But we won't discuss that. She came out with a song called Holy Terrain, and in it, it's just this beautiful expression of femininity and reaching out to a partner, and of course, Future has to then go on to, you know, ruin all these beautiful expectations and, uh, you know, poetry that she's speaking, and, you know, refer to some hypothetical cheating situations, and who knows what a how this guy got confronted with such a beautiful feminine song and still did the same old I will never know. FK Twigs is impressed. I'm not impressed. I think he could have done better. But I love the song, and I think FK did a really excellent, excellent portion on creating it. So what we're going to try and do is be playing that and, you know, let YouTube do their monetization thing. And also some free movement to some other stuff as I, you know, get into it. So all I'm wearing is, like, I've got my little dress on. That's it. I'm ready to move. I'm ready to be free. I'm ready to enjoy and express myself. I'm definitely going to move that light a little bit because it's, like, right in the eyeball holes. And, yeah. But this isn't about you watching me dance. This is about us all dancing together and having that energy. I just wanted you to be able to see my face for a little bit of this while I explain what we're doing today. So welcome to the sacred movement portion, and I hope you're ready to move and dance and express, and you've got something on that's really comfortable that's not going to inhibit you or make you self-conscious or that you'll need to adjust very much either. Real quick, I wanted to add, <clears throat> for our first song is like a warm-up to, um... Tsunami by Ombre, produced by Phoenix. This isn't a very popular song, that's why I'm trying to give you all this info. So, um, A-M-B-R-E, Ombre, I believe is how you say it. I don't know, <laughs> but I love her music, I love her voice, and I thought that this song would be a really good song for um, a connection of that woman-to-woman -woman energy, or I guess in general... <laughs> Because um, the other song by FKA is, like, both songs can be applied to anybody, right? But I just love the diversity of these songs. So those are the two songs that we're doing. 
This one is it's Tsunami by Ombre, and then FKA Twigs, Holy Terrain is the second song we'll be doing, but I'm going to be cutting off Future's part, so it's going to be short. So fluffy, so fluffy. Swear I'm not stalking. I just in my head. Wanna take high with you. Wanna take flight with you. Wanna take flight with you. Mm -hmm. I'm one of your biggest fans. I listen to everything you do. If you don't, I'm only 18. Girl, but I can make a dream come true. Make a dream come true. I know you got a voice, but all I wanna do is sing to you. Let me sing.
our Adinkra studies for today brings us to Okiafopa. And I was so surprised today when I realized that we were already all the way to O, which means we're already almost through the Adinkra cards. There's only a few left, a few weeks left. Amazing. All right, be safe. So, but that's really wonderful. That means we're getting all the way through stuff. This is... Okay, I saw him. I saw him. Um, but that's really exciting. It means we've been going through a lot of information, learning a lot of new different things. So this card means good farmer and is a symbol of diligence and hard work as well as entrepreneurship. Diligence, hard work, and entrepreneurship. A farmer... Okay, please don't pick the figs. A bird dish. Yeah, don't pick it anymore. Let okay. them grow. It's not it's not even ripe yet. A farmer is a nurturer. Through their process of their focus, ritual, and devotion, they stimulate and create our sustenance. This situation requires your undivided attention. Nurture the process to bring your end goal to fruition. So this is a really good time for when you need to be as the farmer. You've planted your seeds, you've taken good care of your dreams, you're helping them grow, and you are kind of getting to that point where you're really in need of, you know, collecting some bounty maybe. Or you're just, you're, you're utilizing this as strength throughout the process, as a, as a form of focus and um, reminder throughout the process as you work on your business, right? You should always have your business altar. You should, if you have a business, right? If you're an entrepreneur, you should have a business altar. We see those very commonly when we go to um, Asian establishments, right? And people will, even of all cultures, will leave money. <laughs> And they don't think twice about it. And that should be kind of the same attitude that we have, is that we are, um, you know, willing to put our altars out there. It is no big deal. And even though people don't understand it or know anything about it, they can also respect it. Um, so, I mean, you, utilizing also work working an altar in private for your business is very powerful, very wonderful. Um, you know, working the candles, your oil lamp, however it is you do it. Um, so, and, and of course, remembering that something like a business, something like whatever your great goal is, does require a lot of attention and nurturing and time and energy like a farmer would. So it says additional meanings, dedication and focus are needed. What would happen if you nurtured your dreams the way you feed your fears? Hard work can never be erased. There you have it. And that's so true, you know. Um, the hard work you put into it today, in th two, three years from now, will still be solid. It will be something that you reach back and you're like, oh wait, I, I did that in my free time. Right? And you'll be able to reach back and use that. So. But we are very close to the end. Very close to the end, y'all. I don't even know what he's doing. So our um, 42 law study for today is I will not mistreat children. And that's so interesting to me because for the last week or so, I've been doing the revising touches on my first book that will be published by someone that is not a self-published, you know, situation, right? I um, sent in, we'll go inside in a little while, but you guys need some fresh air. It's good to go outside and play. And so um, I sent in a book that I wrote about my childhood for... Any who don't know, I am a transracial adoptee. I was adopted by white people when I was four years old, and or around that age. And my adoptive father 
sexually abused me from that around that age until I was about 12 and told and then a whole other host of issues obviously then began with my the rest of my family how they felt about me how I felt about me um, and then this a few years later when I was about 15 is when I met and started dating my now husband and so when I was about 17, I wrote a story about this, a poetic novel, as I called it back then. A novel in verse. I don't know what they call it anymore. And I tried to get it published years later when I was about 18 or 19 or 21. Actually, I would say it was about more 1920s, 21. And I got a bunch of rejections for it because it's depressing and also because it's poetry. And people generally did not want poetry back then um but now poetry is all the rage look at this now look at it now uh poetry is all the rage so i saw something for submissions for poetry and it was um it just i was like okay i i I figured i would submit and just see one more time and then i was like if this one says no i will then just self-publish this one as well but they said yes so I've been in this process of re um doing that book and and looking through that book again this time more through the eyes of a mother which is fresh which is a very fresh perspective um and I think it, you know, I, I'm, therefore, I have a very intimate relationship with the concept of why mistreating children is so awful. And it really is so awful mostly because of their innocence, mostly because there's no, when there's no reason to destroy their innocence so early on things. There's, then there, then you should not it is morally in, unacceptable to do so right there are sometimes you're in extenuating circum, circumstances where indeed your child does have to grow up a little early right like uh, when they experience loss war um, some kind of you know something that you poverty something that you can't really help You will have to break that innocence. About there's, you know, obviously a fine line between that and abuse, right? Mistreatment. That's when you're you're just destroying this innocence, destroying this um, trust, this understanding of how the world should work um, for your own needs, whatever those needs may be. Maybe you're depressed. Maybe you are abused. Tyra, stay on the grass. So, um, I forget where I was going with that because I was like, where is she going? (laughs) Okay, but, um, you know, there is that, um, that immoral standard, right? When you're doing it for yourself, when you're doing it for your own gain, when you're doing it to destroy. And there's like another level to that that's so terrible, um, because when I was rereading some of that poetry, it made me think about how I still called him dad or how I forgave so easily again and again and again. And it reminds you of how, like, um, that's kind of the way children are, right? They, they're kind of prone to forgiveness. They're kind of prone to reading everything as love until they are finally trained to understand that that was not love, that that was abuse. And they're kind of trained to have a have this wholesome understanding. That's the thing that always kind of breaks my heart about my childhood is that wholesome understanding I had. I was so understanding that this person had needs, that that person's would be would be sad about this, that this person, and so and I thought that that was a sign of me being grown up, was to be able to. Oh, I'm so understanding, mother, of why you continuously choose my abuser over me. I'm so understanding. 
um, and there was no such understanding for myself, but it was, I think that was part of childhood as well, is that, that part where, um, children are, are so easy to kind of manipulate and use in that way, and that's part of the other reason why mistreating children, I think, is, is on this list, and um, because it is so grave, and it's so grave because you're kind of destroying a new generation where that could have died, that could have been done, um, but you passed it on, you carried it on. Um, so the mistreatment of children, that's something that I think is such an important law. And um, I know if we're coming to the end of the uh, Adinkra studies, we're going to come to the end of the 42 laws a little while. I think... Actually, I'm not even sure if I remember which one ends first. I think the Adigra ends first, but I can't even remember. Um, but that's okay, because the year is ending, and we have other things that we are going to be studying of a damn shore. And um, I'm really, uh, I'm just so excited for... You have to go potty. I'm just really excited for where we're going to be headed next with this sister circle next year as we finish up the Sacred Woman book for the second year in a row and get started and geared up to um, delve deeper into that lifestyle, what it actually means, applying it to who we are and making it like livable. So like right now it just seems like this huge ass manual um, where we're just like boom, 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 and you got to do this, and you got to do that, and then you got to and all these things, and if you don't, you fail. And that's kind of how it seems when you look at it. But in reality, it's not that, like, heavy of a lifestyle. I feel like it really is that, like, light lifestyle. And it really is that relaxed of a lifestyle. Uh, well, I mean, like, not, like, always relaxed, obviously. But, I mean, once you get into the swing of things and it's habit, it's way chiller and way more put together and cohesive and relaxed than I think other situations are because you can be super relaxed and be living in this environment where you never clean up but then it's like when it's time to find some shit then it's all hell breaks loose so that's kind of the difference that's what I mean so anyways we'll be getting into that stuff more as the year goes on but I'm excited for it and thanks for sticking by as long as you all have right, we're gonna get into our studies I think soon or our chalk first <laughs> guys i just damn near killed myself took the chop and they came in here to show you some shit damn <coughs> that hit was like <coughs> way bigger than i realized okay all right i'm back i'm better so i wanted to take you to a very special part of my house if you can tell we are by the ceiling I'm by my closet and um i wanted to take you here um, mostly because I had skipped over the, oh, my camera's over here. I don't know. Okay, anyway. I had skipped over the section about, um, what was the section about? Oh yeah, the section was about, um, men. And in that section, she talks about altars. A little bit so I did want to talk a little bit about altars I did want to talk a little bit about this because I believe that's the section of the book that did inspire me to make my marriage altar which is being changed very soon so I feel like why not you guys let's share here actually I cut myself off so anyways I don't know where I cut off but I know so uh, you know you it starts off with Queen was talking about having the symbol that represents you and this could be the yoni egg, it could be the, um, a crystal wand or something, right? And you, those things would be kept on the altar and can be, you know, anointed with oils, prayed over, connected with, by the opposite partner, by yourself, um, to create, you know, a, a more, um, concentrated place for both your energy for you guys to center yourselves around for you to uh, reconnect for you to 
be putting your energy into in the same place, right? Because, you know, you both naturally will likely be thinking of the other person and your issues and what have you just off the top. But if you're both putting it into a place that means something. So this, I mean, I, I do think that you can do the marital and couple altar without your spouse's permit, not permission, sorry, participation. Um, but I do think you should get their permission because if you guys are that level of a couple, I don't see why they wouldn't want you praying good things over the relationship, praying for your wellness, praying for their job, praying for you both to have better communication. You know what I'm saying? Meditating over what you could be doing better. I, I just don't see why they wouldn't want that. Uh, but at the same time, it's kind of come to my attention over the years that my husband is incredibly chill compared to a lot of other people, which is, you know, fair. I didn't even think about it. You know, when I was like 18 and I was like, we need to be hand fasted. I was a Wiccan back then. I was like, we need to hand fast. Oh, here it is actually. Right here, little knots still in place. So I was like, we need to be, have a hand fasting. And he was like, all right, where do we drive? Where do we get the ribbons? Uh, we have like this much money. How much, how, where, where, can, where do you think we can go? And you know, he, and, it, and it never occurred to me that like for other people, they're like, are you a witch? You know what I'm saying? So I did get lucky in that regard. However, I do think even when a couple is different religions or they just don't, simply believe in what the other person believes in that there should be an element of respect there um both in the sense that they're accepting of the fact that you believe in something and you practice something and also in the sense that you're willing to say i have an altar here of marriage you know and that they're able to trust that you're not like i don't know doing blood work or something i don't know i don't know what, what like, sometimes I see people comment shit, like, uh, literally on my um, womb healing workbooks Instagram page, I get men all, I'm just talking about basic womb function, and men will be like, but I just don't want blood in my, my spaghetti, that's all. I'm like, like, literally no one is checking for you, sir. You know how much effort it takes to, to even have a cup ready to collect your menstrual blood, like, goddamn, like, like, I'm sure that it's very rare, <laughs> you know, I'm sure we talk about it way more than it actually happens, one, and then two, uh, yeah, the stigmas, y'all, the stigmas, I just, okay, anyways, we're gonna just, I could go off on that for hours, <sighs> the comments, the, and it's not just men, I should say, it's not just men who leave you ignorant, sad comments about womb functions, it's such as period, period blood. But anyways, I, um, I don't know why that's such a huge fear. I don't know why everybody thinks that, like, black women are Jezebels who must be doing black magic. They ain't even that deep. However, I, um... What you doing? I'm making a video. I go down there. <laughs> so tickled that I'm standing on the bed. <laughs> oh, that shows how lame I am. Okay. Anyways. All right, Tyra, Tyra. Tyra, can you, can you whisper? Oh, thank you. Okay, so anyways, I don't know why people fear that stuff so much, but hopefully you're with somebody who can trust. Of course, of course, she's going to play music. But hopefully you're with somebody who is, um, you know, trusting of you and not, you know, believing you're, you're up to all sorts of deviance just because you love them. All right. Or because they love you. <laughs> so I have up here a bunch of things. I'll just hold up real quick. A few of them. We have back here the most obvious. Our kids ripped it, but this was one of, I think this was the first card I made him for the holidays when we um when we moved in together this was like a picture from like before it's a little sexy I don't know if you can even see it it's in black and white printed it right off the computer I was like 18 leave me alone <laughs> and so I have my yoni eggs from uh, a few of them from my journey that I've 
kept and enjoyed. I have some letters that we've written each other. And let's see. possibly be calling me all right anyways uh we bought these when we were 18 you know it's just little things my first I ring that i wore candy. but the candy. oh okay of course she broke the cup i don't even know where she got the cup that she broke because the cup that she's been using is still sitting at the table <laughs> but anyways all right so um, what else did I want to talk about? Oh, I also, this is a pregnancy candle that I made when I was pregnant with the twins. And at the time, they were like, make this so you can light it when you're um, in labor, blah, 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 or going into labor. I don't know. But when I went into labor, my brain was like, don't light this candle. This is bullshit. No, not right now. I was like, you need to light this candle the next time, like, you want to be pregnant. And so, I was, that's what the intention from which I made this candle. And so, I, you know, I have all these, like, this symbolism with it, but I really enjoyed that. So, I put that up there, too, when that was all over. And then I also have a bunch of elephants my husband got me. And a few items that my, um, were my, oh, I also have my other ring up here, too. That was my second ring, but I can't wear that anymore, either, for other various reasons. I'm really hard on my rings. I'm really hard with my hands. That's why I was like, I need to get, like, tattoos or something and just, like, update those every once in a while. Because I'm sure it would be cheaper than, than what I do to rings. Anyways. <laughs> I also have this from my mother-in-law so and she is an ancestor um and so I like to keep that energy with it too that ancestral energy too but that's just for me um I don't have any ancestor altars in this room because it is the bedroom and yeah that's we all know why I don't have the ancestor altars in here so, I mean, um, yeah, that's why I have the marital altar in here, though. It's, like, a really simple, easy place to come and connect and think about the marriage, think about things. It's also nice because, you know, even when you're just laying on the bed, I really like how this one is up here because it, um, I don't know, it just, it, like, draws your eye. It makes you think about it. It's colorful, so it kind of just, yeah, it just makes you think about the marriage, it makes you think about the intentions, even when you're just casually sitting around or you're just um, hanging out on the bed or whatever, then it's, I can see it, it's really nice. So I like to always have it visible, but having this little shelf up here was really cool when I moved in, and I knew just where it was going there. And I always find it interesting, real quick, before I finish off with this talk about marital altars, is just, um, it's always interesting how whenever my husband's friends <laughs> whenever my husband's friends come over it's funny which of them can like catch eye of the altar I feel like it's always the ones who are most single who like are like is that an altar what is that for and so I'm like oh yeah I think like because the other ones like never seem to notice they'll just because we have this like door obviously that's where all that light comes in and uh they'll walk through most people just chill straight through, but, um, yeah, my husband's most desperate friends are like, Phew. but I don't know, maybe they're just like super eagerly looking around the room like, what's the secret? I don't know. They're always asking for advice, and I'm like, Ugh. I'm like, I don't have the time for this. You have to pay me, honey. I don't want to be mean, but I'm like, oh, baby, this isn't, this isn't a one night conversation. This is months months of hard work <laughs> I'm being super catty but I've known these people for like a really long time so you know to you to you I'm being very catty but to me I'm accurately assessing people I've known for about a decade <laughs> so like people who are not my friends but who I've had to listen to their things and see them repeatedly for a long time 
since they were in high school. So, anyways, uh, back to the altar talk. Um, yeah, I think it's just a really wonderful and beautiful way. And, okay, and here's my thing is if the other person doesn't know that you're, you know, praying over them, etc., like, I don't know, maybe there's, like, like I, like I always say, there's always some, there's always some fangled way in which it's, like, actually, like, a really beautiful thing that you're praying over your relationship or, like, what have you. But, um, I do think it's, like, a very serious thing to start bringing your spirituality into relationships and stuff and that it shouldn't be taken lightly however you do it and that an open door policy is just, to me it's the best to me it's what works and to me i think long term it's just better not have secrets like that cuz cuz i'll be real it's not it's it's mostly because christians and abrahamic religions their people are often dangerous historically for people with indigenous, tribal religions and spiritualities, for people, which is, you know, from the broadest scope of the word down to the narrowest scope of the word, all of it, you know, witchcraft, all of it, it's dangerous, you know, and it's especially dangerous when they think they've been betrayed, confoodled, and then you're just like, I didn't need magic. You're you're here because I'm me. This, like you know, and like I feel like you know you're here because black girl magic. Like I didn't have to even work any black girl magic, and I'm just here. I'm just existing. And people, you know, they take it the wrong way. So, anyways, you got to be careful. I think, especially in relationships, um, it would really make me sad if I was I had to be like in the closet for my husband on that. And, like, I mean, like, and, like, I say in the closet mostly because I had altars in my closet as a teen. <laughs> oh, that's hella funny. But, like, you know, it's not funny. I, I, I get messages all the time on spiritual black girls from teenagers who have tiny altars in boxes. Tiny altars that they draw, that they, you know, make outside. And it's beautiful, but it's sad. Um, and it's sad that they think they'll lose their home or that they'll be beaten or sent to an institution of some sort. Um, but yeah, that's the reality. So, um, and that's the reality today. In 2019, as I speak, people today are getting killed because people think they're involved in witchcraft because people know that witchcraft is something that can be weaponized against and people will justify it and say it is okay and that um any you know you can still be discriminated I've been kicked out of a home in the last four years because I or three years because I had tarot cards they saw me get tarot cards in the mail and I I was excited Oh, like, you know, it's crazy, it's surreal, but it happens, and it's, it's happening. So anyways, with your union, your sacred union, I do think it's so important, so, so important. To be honest, especially if you're going to do something to this caliber, you're going to have somewhere where you're lighting candles, rubbing essential oils on replicas of each other's, or symbolism of each other's, like, spiritual essence, or genitalia, or anything like that. So our um, Sacred Woman Studies takes us up on page 346 um, with the myth of Ost, Isis, and Dasar, Osiris. Um, and it was right after the part about setting up the altar for the spiritual awakening of the Jed, D-J-E-D. Um, it's how she refers to the man's phallic region, or the phallic region of people, should I say? And, um, yeah, so that's why I started us up on the marital altar thing. Um, but yeah, I think it's also very beautiful to have the altar there, um, 
and have, you know, special oils to utilize for each other, special scents to evoke each other's essence. Um, that's very important, too. And, you know, me and my husband have um, these very nice, fragrant oud oils that we've used in the past from... We've used them from the Royal Bloodline. I'm not the hugest fan. Like, they're, I'm, I'm a fan, like, or as in, like, I... I was a supporter for a long time, um, but I wouldn't say that, like, I totally think that they're the, the best example of spiritualists to follow. However, they make some really nice oud, and it's amazing smelling, and it's black owned, <laughs> and it's useful, and, um, very receptive to things, so I've, I've used it and blessed it, and, um, like I said, I've enjoyed some of their scents, but they're not very uh, reliable. I've I've gone back a few times to try and find the particular essences that I've enjoyed, scents that I've enjoyed in the past, and it, it will be some really random. So I'll be like there looking for something that I thought would be like a mainstay, and then like it's like alien ood, and I'm like alien, who who. Who's working with the aliens? Who? What is that? I don't know nobody who work with the aliens. Do you? Do you? I don't. But you know what? I, um, on Spiritual Black Girls, I say I, I try and support everybody. I support Black Wiccans. I support, you know, Black people who work with fairies. You know, I, I, I support all the people who work with all these random, you know, spiritualities that typically would not be associated with black people but also aren't christianity or you know abrahamic religions so if you with the aliens tell me about that i'd love to hear <laughs> i'd love to hear about why you're buying special essences to connect with the alien life forms or what extraterrestrial life forms you've experienced communication with so the myth of os and asar or isis and osiris in the myth of Austin Asar, the jealous Seth slew his brother Asar, dismembered the body into 14 pieces, and cast them to the Nile. When Ost discovered the treacherous deed, she was overwhelmed with grief. Determined to resurrect her beloved and bear a sacred child, Ost and her sister, Nebethet, Nephthys, searched the river until they had found and reassembled all the body parts but one. The jet of Vassar had been consumed by a huge fish. Ost created a new penis of gold and cedar wood for her beloved. Then she began to dance around the body, dancing and singing and chanting prayers and magical incantations faster and faster and more and more passionately until her arms became vast wings. Ost hovered over Asar and breathed life back into his body. As his jed rose, Ost made sacred love to her beloved one last time and became impregnated with his seed. She conceived the sacred child Haru, Horus, the beautiful hawk-headed god of light. For years after the birth of Haru, Ost and Nebethet traveled the dusty roads of Egypt, teaching the arts of weaving, agriculture, in healing, and establishing temples for the worship of Asar. In the sacred precinct of each temple, Ost caused the jet of Asar to be created as a Tekken, T-E-K-H-E-N, and placed it upon the altar as a symbol of a regener of a re of regeneration and rebirth. This is the legendary origin of the worship of the sacred Jed and why we place the Tekken on the altar of a sacred man. So, um, I do think this is a very beautiful story, right? It's a very beautiful story of resilience, of, of having somebody who will fight for you no matter what. And I think that is a beautiful essence of what a sacred union can really hold for people they're willing to do that for somebody else and they're willing to um, have that be given to them in return. Holistic lovemaking is all about creation. So, uh, and like, I think that is a very beautiful, uh, you know, segue into holistic lovemaking and creation. 
because, you know, she just got done talking about all that work that just got put into that creation. Horus didn't just come out of nowhere. Uh, this thing that she needed that she was trying to make didn't come out of nowhere. She had to dance and dance and dance until she sprouted wings. And that part actually is funny because, not funny, but, you know, it reminds me of a lot of African-American folk tales that have to do with taking flight. Um, and, you know, the most recent I can think of in popular literature is Toni Morrison, Song of Solomon. Solomon flies away, leaving his wife. Um, and I was reminded of this tale also because I was recently looking through the freed slave narratives um, from the U.S., obviously. I mean, actually, I do believe there are others from the diaspora. But I was looking through some from the United States and came across a passage in which a young woman, Teresa, I believe was her name, was talking, or no, I think maybe her name was Rise, I'm not sure. Anyways, she was talking about her mother, and she said her mother was fresh from Africa, and she was born of her mother here. And her mother knew the ways, her mother taught her some things. And she was saying one day, right in front of her in the fields, her mother started spinning and span until she could rise. So she rose and she flew back to Africa. She said it happened right in front of her. And she said she tried to spin herself. Many times she tried, but she, she said she wished her mother had taught her how. She did not ever um, manage to do so herself. Uh, in the story Song of Solomon, Solomon's wife, you know, she's left with a lot of children in a, a very abusive, obviously slavery situ type of situation as well. Um, and she does not handle it nearly so well as the very s stout, grave voice from the narrative in the narratives. Um, which is a real story, right? That's a real woman who lived and was interviewed. In the novel, the wife um, kind of breaks under that pressure of, of being alone, of being abandoned, of being abandoned with such a huge responsibility and burden as many children as she has. So anyways, that reminds me also, we also have the one of, um, I think it's a kid's book of... of um, Uh, like tales, uh, like the people could fly, I believe is the name of it. And I, I believe the illustrators were Leo and Diane, something like that. And they, um, they were a couple, an interracial couple, and they did a lot of artwork, black artwork for, you know, different publications and such, uh, decades ago, but their book, it, it, their illustrations, you you know them when you see them, and they're very poignant, very beautiful, and were used for a lot of illustrations, like such as children's books and uh, other kind of fantasy, beautiful type of situations. Um, so, anyways, uh, they um, it's just that flying aspect. It's cool to see. All the way back here, we have somebody who who span and danced until she sprouted wings and that I, I was like that is a story I've heard so many times before that was a very familiar story to me as a black American um so anyway so for the, for those who are always like we're not Egyptian like I know we're not Egyptian we're no, of course we're not Egyptian that's okay and like it shows you Egyptians were black it shows you it's very African there are like things that you see especially like when you look at things like architecture, art, storytelling, traditions, you know, like it's just, it's, you can tell where certain things are for, from. So I, my kids were just finishing up their yogurt and I um, put them in their room uh, for the evening. And um, while I was doing that, it made me think about I, or I was thinking about the altar in this conversation, uh, the marriage altar, the sacred union altar, the couple's altar. And I also thought it would be a very beautiful thing to perhaps put a um, <clears throat> journal 
um, on the altar, a very small notebook um, that you can both write to each other as well as write affirmations, prayers, drawings, thoughts, etc., um, symbols, pictures, tuck in things that matter to you as a couple. And, you know, uh, maybe change that out once a year and uh, see how that works for you. But that might be another beautiful way. Like, I'm just trying to think of ways that um, kind of speak to different types of people. Um, having music there, having waist beads. I know that, like, you know, you can, like, anoint each other's waist beads or anoint the other's waist beads. Um, there are, yeah, there's just so many, the possibilities are endless, especially, you know, as people are very different as a couple. Like, there's things that work for you know, most of humanity, but then there's such all that beautiful nuance that goes into um, loving an individual and caring for an individual and their unique needs. And I think that having an altar together that's specifically for your relationship is a beautiful way to um, grow spiritually as a couple. Focus on your relationship, be committed to it, be committed to you being, you know, a team, you being, um, a force that's moving towards goals that, you know, are hopefully similar in nature or hopefully, you know, in the same ballpark landing out there. And, um, yeah, I think, you know, a lot of people are kind of tr trying to find ways to be spiritual, especially spiritual as a couple. I know black people love doing that. We love that. And, um, of course we love it cause it's powerful. You know what I mean? Um, there's, there's beauty, there's power to be had, you know, anybody who's ever engaged in any kind of spiritual, magical, sexual act knows that, you know, it can be wonderful. And so I know that a lot of people would want that, even though they're no longer Christian or upholding those standards, they still want to uphold standards. And that's a very black thing to do. It's a very African thing to do. We do it all across the diaspora. So it's not surprising that that's something that we're reaching for. And I think it's very possible. And, um, you know, there are so many little beautiful ways we can do it. Um, but there, you know, I, I do suggest making that altar just because, you know, your ancestor altar isn't really exactly what you'd be. I mean, you should, your ancestors should be pray to, talk to. I, I consider them my most valuable form of el elder when it comes to my relationship, when it comes to thinking things through about my relationship, figuring things out. However, <laughs> you know, there that's not the main focus of the relationship is the ancestors necessarily. That's like us, our spirit. As it is t today, we are two spirits here on earth that happen to connect. Um, and so that's something that should be valued and worked on in its own right. So yeah, I think that's um, something that just popped up in my head. That's all I wanted to say on that. Um, we're going on to, I left you all off on holistic lovemaking is all about creation. Um, it comes to us from ancient co uh, comet when Ost conceived the sacred child Haru by regenerating the jet of her beloved Asar. The sacred woman of today uses her kitchen healing laboratory to restore herself her mate, for creating the spiritual gold inherent in their organ of regeneration. This consciousness creates and enhances dynamic holistic lovemaking, and in turn, holistic lovemaking creates a healthier future for the sacred children of the union, coming into the world in a state of peace, harmony, and balance. Um, so here, I think, is a really beautiful place to show, um, again, symbolic, or, yeah, symbolically, she's can, she can be speaking, but she can also be speaking literally here. So there's the literal sense of caring for our bodies, caring for our psyches, caring for our relationships, and in that way, birthing new, healthier generations. And then there's the side where we are physically caring for that around us in order to facilitate our goals, those things that we're creating, those futures that we are manifesting that may or may not you know, have children that we've birthed. Um, personally, but, you know, we, we, we all have this beautiful idea of where we're thinking in the future, we're thinking, um, you know, there's uh, no more racism, no more classism, no more, you know, phobias of different sorts, um, there's more equality, there's uh, more, you know, there's less stress, uh, economic stress, there's more, you know, uh, social connections, more communal connections, more social help and aid 
and brotherly love and less uh, destruction of the planet, right? We have all these ideas and these ideas are going to take, you know, work. They're going to take hands-on work, digging into the sand. They're going to take dancing and moving until we sweat. They're going to take all of these, you know, methods of restoration, right? Recreation, reaching back and finding something and not having the recipe. So having to, you know, break it down alchemically and build it back up from scratch. So um, I do think this talk of sacred union isn't simply uh, you know, talking about one other random person that you may start connecting with. It is also referring to, you know, a sacred union you can be creating with other entities in your life, right? Kind of in the same way that a nun is married to God or Jesus, whatever, and a priest or priestess is also, it, it, they've in many ways married to a system, a belief, etc. Um, here you would also create a sacred union between yourself and everything else. And that is, I think, kind of why this is in the back of the book, because it's, in essence, that's what we've been doing this whole time, is trying to create a sacred union between our brain and our mouth, between our spirit and our womb, between our... Um, self in the kitchen and our home and our friends, right? It's all been slowly growing upwards and outwards and expelling out and expanding out, out, out to the bigger, to the more, and everything is supposed to be this sacred union. And that is why I say that this book is so hoodoo <laughs> to its very core, because that's that's what it is it's that lifestyle it's that understanding down to your essence it's that everything you touch everything you're around has this meaning has this understanding has this essence and that is a lot of why um especially this year i've been taking it so seriously um the things i have in my house I've been taking that so seriously I've been taking it very critically I've uh, been trying to look into it, and I've been slowly growing more detached to things that I've held on to for a really long time, things that I'm like, oh, I, have a, I honestly don't know. Like, the last time I moved was when it became so clear to me. Like, before then, I'd been like, oh, I got rid of this, I got rid of that, but then I'd still been kind of holding on to some strange, random little things, and then in my mind, they made a lot of sense. Um... But this year, you know, is when it's become even more clear to me. It, it makes me actually sad to see things around my house that I haven't looked at or touched in months. Or that, and I have no inclination to do so, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Nothing's calling me to go pull that thing down and use it and do something with it. It's just been kind of kicking around my life. And it, it breaks my heart to think about, like, kind of, that disconnectedness, that wastefulness, because that disconnect has kind of relates back to the disconnect that I've had with Mother Nature. That's part of why I decided to go permanently barefoot is because I was like, wow, you know, uh, I remember being a child and being especially called to be barefoot, to be, you know, with nature. But um, I dismissed that. I was like, it's just being a child. You know what I'm saying? Um, and it makes me sad that I, I lost that and that I've gotten to places in my life where I've been so disconnected <laughs> with nature, with life. Um, and, you know, th for me, it is very powerful to walk on the concrete. And through the soles of my feet, I can really sense, you know, and I like that underneath that, that's life, that's earth, there's earth, there's covered earth, you know, um, and that's not even something I realized until I started taking environmental classes, and they used terms, and like, that describe how much of the land is covered, and how much of the land is not covered in certain cities, and certain areas, and it really makes you think, yes, this, this land, this was once not covered, you know what I mean, um, you see, you or or rather you me I grew up here in California and so a lot of my environmental classes had to do with California had to do with environmentalists well known here in California such as John Muir and um 
it's heartbreaking sometimes to read their works because while they understood the connection to the land, they disparaged the people, right? They were like these natives just lazing it out, blah, 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 blah. But it's almost like they couldn't understand that their culture is what was preserving that landscape. And that as white people, their culture is what was leading to the destruction of that landscape to ultimately, I don't know if you know this, but um, Yosemite, the famous Yosemite, had a twin park, a twin national, well, it wasn't a national park. It never got to that status, unfortunately, for its demise. Uh, but it was, uh, I believe, called Hedge Hedgey, and I, I believe it was considered Yosemite's equal in beauty. Uh, it was like a twin. It was like, it was like it had been carved out exactly the same way almost, two peas in a pod, if you think Yosemite is beautiful, you would have thought Hedge Hetchy was gorgeous. It's the same beauty, same level of beauty, same level of prestige. Um, but it was, it's to this day used as a dam. It was dammed up. It was, they put that wall there and they filled that, that valley up. They filled that bitch right up, killed all the animals there. Um, and that was in response to San Francisco's fire, that famous fire, that famous earthquake, and then the pan fire that broke out the next day and burned down half the city um and they were like we need water here and we need to figure that out and so that was the plan that was created that was what was uh put up there and so the reason i say that story is just to say culturally john muir's own culture the very culture that he found superior to the native people he met when he would roam the gorgeous amazing yosemite area the amazing valleys of California, the mountains, oh, these trees, these trees just growing, growing, growing. Oh, have you seen this? Have you seen that? And it was just, it's it's so interesting to see that disconnect. And it's, uh, you do need that connection. <laughs> you can't just, can't just think that the, the world is beautiful and not see how your own lifestyle will eventually lead to that type of, that thing's demise. How, even though you're trying to quarantine it to this city and the city life, and then I come out here and now I'm in the country, I'm a country man, and I spend months out here, you're, you're still disconnected. Because when you go back to the city, your mind is not on what was right beneath your feet. Because all of California used to look like that. When you see those original pictures of California, it's just mind blowing. In fact, when I think of my childhood, even here in the Bay Area, I think about the hills, the rolling hills. And I remember these hills because I daydreamed about these hills. As a little girl, we would have to drive past these hills for a long time. We would, we would um, for a while there, we lived in like Sunnyvale and had to go all the way to Redwood City. So it was like an hour drive every day there and then an hour back so I saw these hills you know what I mean that was like a hell of a commute I saw them and I would think about them and I when I was a little girl I used to think I wanted to live in those hills they were just so lush and like the yellow grasses and the big thick trees and I was like I would live under one of those trees I was like I don't know eight but I remember this I remember that they were just so open as far as your eyes could see just hills and now you drive those hills and there's mansions scattered all around the hills. There's places where I used to see the horses and the cows run. And those places are nothing but buildings now. And um, it just goes to show, you know, it, it changes so rapidly. And it's not something that can be helped if you're not focusing culturally. And so that's why I really think, you know, if you're trying to connect with that nature, you're trying to create that sacred union with nature. It is so important to to really actually be connected in some way. So for me, it actually has been so helpful to be connected through the barefoot um, to to actually, you know, it, it makes me pay attention to not only the fact that this land is covered or covered in concrete or how this part of the world is being treated, but also, you know, like the littering uh, makes me a, very aware of what's all over the ground in front of me, around me, how other people are acting and reacting, how disconnected they are. And um, it's just, it's very enlightening. But yeah, that's why, I mean, like this, this at the end of the book, because we're about to get to the... We're about to be doing the initiation, y'all. We got one more, and we're about to be doing, like, the end of this book. So that's why I really want to try and bring it full circle with this sacred union. 
It is about, you know, creation. It is about your connection with everything. All of this is going to be a sacred union by the time you really understand. And it's going to be second nature eventually. That's the other thing is right now it's like, oh, I, I was supposed to do this. I was supposed to do that. I fucked up this. I fucked up that. But it's uh, it's not habit yet, right? It's not habit for you to use sacred words. It's not habit for you to use a certain tone. It's not habit for you to sit a certain way, talk a certain way act a certain way, react a certain way. And that's not to say that you're trying to create a whole person that isn't you. You're still being genuine. You're still being authentic. You're still speaking your own mind. However, you're doing it from a place of being connected. You're doing it from a place of being understanding, of being centered, of not doing it just from your own egotistical centered point of view. You're doing it from a place of trying to be focused on that ultimate goal that you actually have, right? That that's you, you've, you're, um, and then I do think that, you know, as you evolve in life, that's still always, you No one would argue that, you know, 16 year old you was you that, uh, you know, 20 year old you was you 10 years. From, it, it's very strange to me when people are just totally shocked at people who, 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 as they evolve, as they change, as they grow, and they're like, I remember three years ago, she was doing this, and yeah, I mean, three years ago, I was in the shelter, you know, like, it's, it'd be like that, it's, it, there's a lot of different shit that goes on in life, you know what I'm saying, and like, uh, you know, three years is a long time, especially, I would say, in spiritual, you know, if you're working on yourself, Three years from now, you will, will be a totally different person. I think three years from now, I'll be a totally different person. You know, um, and, and what's cool is, is I knew three years ago I wanted to be a totally different person. but And I am, but it's not who I thought I'd be. Like, I projected a whole bunch of stuff, and I, I thought I'd be doing all this other crazy stuff. Like, when I started my Sacred Woman journey, I was like... I was ready. I was like, let me be, release, like, my abuse. Let me release, like, my disconnect. Let me release all these issues I have. Like, I just, like, um, when I was a little girl, I read a book where they, this guy was talking about how, like, in, in it, this girl walks in, there's, like, a scene of a party, and this girl walks in the room, and the girl who's narrating the story is just kind of like, you know, you ever seen somebody, and you just kind of want to fucking be them? You just want to be them. You want to you know, move like they do, you want to have their confidence in themselves, you want to have their surety, their swag, their aesthetic, you just want to be them. I remember feeling that as like a little kid a lot, and I especially, when I first started my Sacred Woman journey, I was, it wasn't like Erica Badu, I would say it was more like a Rihanna, like if, if Rihanna was spiritual, right? I wanted to be like a spiritual Rihanna. And so it's like, I was just like, I, I was hyper focused on this image. And then, you know, I had to come to grips with like, yeah, there's a lot of things I do relate to about Rihanna. However, she like, I'm not Rihanna. And like, I actually don't agree with a lot of the stuff she thinks or does. So, you know, it's just, you know, as I've grown older, I've come to realize that I was just kind of trying to project out. And I think a lot of people do that, right? We're trying to project out, we're trying to be look like Queen, because she could damn like, you know, her life is like, sh when you meet Queen, when you see her in action, you hear her talking, you see like, just every move she makes, there's like this magic about it. There's just you're in a trance, you're like, take me, take me away, and, you know, um, she has a very, you know, it's that surety, but it, it, that took time, that took time for her to get to that point where she had that surety with her movement, with her everything, and some people have a little bit of that, you know, as a younger person, but she definitely has that, like, wisdom and that, you know, practice, you know what I'm saying, like, there's being confident when you're 20, and then there's that confidence when you're in, like, steady, of being older than like 50 and I think you know that queen really embodies that for sure she definitely embodies that you know understanding that wisdom that strength and so it's hard to not want to be her you know when you meet her or even Erica Badu you know I think she's a lot more people see her for you know being flawed now but um there was a time where she was like the perfect one and like, she could do no wrong, and so people really want to be her. Um, but just wanting to be that person isn't the same as releasing the essence of who you are, that genuineness of who you are, being so comfortable in your own 
genuine nature and that sacred union you have with the world, that sacred connection you have with everything around you. So um, she says, my work and research on holistic lovemaking was inspired by three important issues. One, I find it very important for us to balance every part of ourselves in order to live to the fullest. So that I think I was covering earlier, you know, um, like when I was talking about how, you know, when your home is all in order and then it's like, you can just go do this, you can just go do that. Or when your home falls out of order, it's very easy to put back in order because it's not a fucking mess to begin with. When I was teaching you guys about the sacred space, Marie Kondo, that is one of the biggest lessons that her books teach with the sacred space lessons is that when your space is in order, your whole area could go to shit. Like your kids, you know, you, 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 you got drunk on Friday, you slept in or you're and then you were like letting your kids run around and then, uh, like you, you weren't used to drinking. So it totally affected you. And then you wait, you're looking around Sunday afternoon and you're just like, God damn, it's, it's just a mess in here. But if your home is to the point where you're not, you don't just have a bunch of random shit in it that isn't necessary, that tidying process is going to be only like two, three hours tops, right? It's going to be like two, three hours tops, and then your home is back to condition. Whereas when you're having a home where you've carried boxes upon boxes of things that, you know, just stagnant energy, just stuff, and then it's like that's already taking up space, and so that's space you can't use for things that you actually need, so then you have things you actually need just flying all over the place. Like, then you just, then you're set up for being um, so much less put together, so much less um, organized. Here, I just realized this wasn't open, so it's a little dark in here. All right, but anyways, you're you're kind of setting yourself up for, you know, having less success. So, you know, when she's talking about living your life to the fullest, I think that, you know, you do live your life to the fullest when you've taken the time to lay the foundation of stuff so that you're ready when the time comes, so that you're capable so that um you know it's like when you want, need to bust out your uh sewing stuff your art supplies or your books or I don't know whatever it is you do you know where it is it's not this mad scramble this way that way oh have you seen it did you know uh well last I saw the baby was playing with it you know what I'm saying and then it's then it's just you know it, that already adds like a level of stress to something that didn't even need that level of stress um Two, she mentions that future generations are at stake. And this is, I think, a key component, right? Because um, one thing that that really I always try to focus on is when people say that this is their goal, I try and look at like, okay, but is that your goal? Are we looking at the same end game totally here? Are we looking at it from a holistic, like as in all the different facets point of view so that we are getting to the right situation because you know um sometimes people say that they want something but then they're doing things that it's like okay but if we really apply that to continued generations how do you think that will go like it, it, i i want to be with you but it's like i'm really actually trying to make the world a better place before i leave because i would have liked it if this had been fucking fixed by when i got here here I am, wasting my life, trying to fucking fix it before I leave. So, I like, like I do want to fucking do it, you know what I'm saying? And so, yes, future generations are at stake. Um, choosing to do the right thing, not the easy thing, is important because future generations are at stake. And that doesn't mean we're always sacrificing ourselves. We're never happy because other people. But it does mean that we are leading by example, that we are making choices so that we're not directly inhibiting future generations and that hopefully we're doing right by them um and you know part of that is through making sacred unions through having more sacred unions and i'll be real you know i've noticed that you know we do have all these issues and we are predominantly or we have been predominantly christian so i do believe that there does need to be a shift spiritually in the dynamics of our family that leads to a place where we can be raising the next future generations in a healthy, whole way, uh, communal way. Three, she says, too often TV and films present intercourse as violent and negative and not as lovemaking at all. Holistic lovemaking is the answer for total fulfillment and for peace between a man and a woman. Holistic lovemaking represents the restoration of the new man and the new man and the new woman. 
So this, I think, is actually really important. This is so important. Queen touches on a really important issue here. It is said that the majority of people are getting their sexual education from porn. That is what I've been hearing these last several years, is the majority of us are being introduced to sex, taught what we know about sex, taught what we know about what genitalia and body parts are supposed to look like, taught what we're supposed to know about how lubrication works, how bodies work, and we know how lubrication works in a porn. They just spit. That's that's how we're supposed to get the get the pussy wet in a porn, right? That's where people are getting their education. I'd be damned. I swear to God, I would I would kick a man out if he ever spit on my pussy. I swear. When I read, I've been reading shit like that. I'm like, <laughs> that's only an indication of what's to come. He knows that little is only an indication of what's to come. But I digress. The issue is is not only are people learning from porn because wait. This could be a wonderful thing if porn was educational, if it had all these other facets, if there was, if it wasn't so problematic, this could be wonderful, right? Free education, people knowing what the hell's going on, they understand it, they get it, that would be great. But the issue is, is partially the issue is, is the industry is overwhelmingly run by a certain group of people with a certain sexuality with a certain race, with certain uh, preferences. And these preferences have leaked onto everything. If you have ever been on a porn site, even the most popular, go to Pornhub, take note of the um, rating of different people, different bodies. Note their races. Uh, they're generally certain people are preferred. Generally, certain people are put on the front screens. Generally, only people of uh, different, you know, genders and sexualities are put on only when they can pass or appear, you know, in the needs of cis white men. <laughs> it's it's really sad because um, the, the fact is, is that... Um, People of color in general are just degraded beyond measure throughout pornography. Porn in general is just derogatory. I mean, overwhelmingly, most of the porn, free porn that you'll see is done by white women. And a lot of it is very degrading for being free porn, for being just content. You can just see it's highly degrading. That is the stuff that is on the front page. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's the stuff that's on the very front. Um, it's the stuff that's the most accessible. You have to go into super niche categories to get to other content. And that content, you have to wade through de derogatory content. And it's interesting also, um, Tumblr, if you, if you were around for that, you're going to stick around for this rant for me. Um, had a had a sector of it where it kind of created a community of marginalized people. I would say mostly women, and probably non men, but mostly women. Um, and it was it, it became a place where you could scroll to get content that was romantic, that was sexy, that was love loving. It had feeling. It had passion. Right. That was part of why. I think that that community grew. There is such a thirst to not be degraded, to not see that kind of content. And it made me realize that, yes, we do need to share beautiful romantic imagery, but there's such a need for it and nobody's doing it. When we see TV shows, it's usually the roughest, craziest, it, there's no romance. They don't drag romance out. It makes people uncomfortable. But they'll drag out, like, violence. Violence can get dragged the fuck out. But romance doesn't tend to get dragged out. Sexy, steamy doesn't get tend to get dragged out. And if it gets dragged out, it's usually Fifty Shades type. Deviants, whippings, beatings, manipulation not sexy to a lot of people.
to some people, yes, because we've been, like she said, it's dangerous. You're getting trained from a very young age because it's content you can get your hands on. That's how people are now in this modern age coming to learn. So I do think that, yes, that um, this content is something that does need to be focused on. There is a deep need, especially for people of color, marginalized people, I would say uh, fat people, disabled people, um, people of certain age groups. Um, there's a need for serious need to, to look into this, to look into who is running these industries, why they're able to control the voice of the industries. Because again, that's why we also see, I think, the um, rise in not just people enjoying plastic surgery, but feeling like it's necessary. Like, I, dude, I can't even participate until I get a boob job, until I get a, you know, uh, my ass much bigger, until I get fillings all up in my face. There's a reason why filling Botox type stuff is now prevalent mostly among 20s, women in their 20s getting these types of fillers and stuff done to be perfect um, as opposed to trying to look younger women like trying to avoid the aging process it's like slowly worked its way down the scale um, but I do think that partially also can be rooted in the porn industry which kind of the, the sex industry the you know um, street culture does tend to grow and permeate out into the outer world so I do believe that um, this is like kind of one of the more negative consequences that has come from white men running the porn industry, the sex industry, as they have been for the duration of online pornography and films, uh, which they tend to create as well. So, um, the people just aren't getting that, um, visual Right. And so there is a true need, not only for those visuals, not only for those movies, but for us in real time to be trying to find that way to understand that we're not what we're seeing is not that and to be able to try and create it within ourselves to try and create that and not try and get it through those actions, which are clearly not uh, going to take us to the right path. So she also says um, it can lead to the creation of a di divine baby, but it can also lead to the creation of love, peace an idea, a whole new world. So the holistic lovemaking has so many possibilities, so much potential, um, you know, so much uh, that it can give you that it just, it shouldn't only be concentrated on the creation of a child. Um, holistic lovemaking brings a harmonious oneness within the union. It is an embrace of body, mind, spirit, and beauty, a total connection, total trust, um, being totally yourself. This love level of lovemaking cannot be experienced if you do not have a committed union. That level of trust and love allows you to be open to express and exchange, to love freely and unhampered. Um, and I think, you know, that's just something we all know. There's levels to relationships. And um, being with somebody who you love and trust totally, fully, uh, just does lead to a different level because then you're able to um, express those needs and desires and have somebody else wanting it for you and with you as well. Um, an unhealthy union brings about false ideas and false reflections. A healthy union is able to create spiritual oneness, inner peace, joy, and rejuvenation. There are also certain love positions along with breathing techniques that can heal the body from disease. She recommends Sexual Secrets, The Alchemy of Ecstasy by Douglas Nick Penny Slinger and Nick Douglas. Um, then we have holistic lovers unblocked energy, tension, and stress. In preparation for the full love embrace, they should take a salt and herbal bath, massage each other, drink rejuvenating herbal tonics, as well as live vegetable or fruit juices in order to be in the proper loving meditative state. This way you don't come to the love exchange with devitalized fluids and body tensions only to release stress and anxiety into and through the partner. So I do think that is a wonderful method to help with the love. Um, keep up with the spiritual baths. Bathe your partner. Pour the waters over their heads and, and pour prayer over them as well, right? Um, taking that time to have that special love connection 
is just so powerful. And then, of course, rubbing yourselves down with oils. Those can be oils you've infused and praised, prayed over as well. Um, and that can be something you also keep right on your um, marriage altar. Um, and you can, you know, rub each other down and then you're completely cleansed and rejuvenated for your lovemaking session. Um, maybe you'll be tired though. You'll, maybe you'll be to, to wake up the next morning. I don't know, but hopefully you won't be too exhausted. Don't do it on a day when someone's been working way too hard and might get tired through all of this, but you know, get, get yourselves in the habit of cleansing each other, um, caring for each other physically and spiritually. Um, in holistic loving, one's orgasm is not localized. It works freely and intensely throughout the body. If you cleanse through the healthy diet, exercise, and prayer, you will experience a total body orgasm that will be felt in your back, neck, head, and face. All parts of you will receive this positive love healing exchange. Um, so I think, yeah, they... they um, that vitality, that vitality you'll be feeling as well as the connection with the partner, the trust, the love um, will definitely lead to higher levels or should I say different levels of love making? because um, I'm sure there are some highs out there that can come from some pretty toxic partners. So this is a very healthy, beautiful, holistic way. And of course, again, can only be felt with somebody who you totally trust, who you um no trusts you as well and you both can have this beautiful exchange so um she has here holistic love making can only be established by this holistic lifestyle she says for reawakening your tired genitalia she recommends live food diet fruits vegetables whole grains proteins herbs natural um hygiene and live juices, fruits, and vegetables. This can also help with spiritual balance, longevity, um, still looking youthful and uh, vital in the face, um, in deep love within the union. Um, also, it, uh, for, I guess, reawakening of the sleeping vagina, I would, I would also recommend, um, I think it's called maca root. It's like a white powder. Um, from South America and that stuff can definitely get you like feeling it. I'm telling you all that a little of that to your smoothie every day and you'll be good to go. Um, let's see. We have for the love fluids to be rejuvenated and cleansed to prevent disease. Also enhanced creativity and energy levels during love making. She says using clays for cleansing as well as water work, do drinking the water and bathing in it. For greater sensitivity, which equals the greater orgasm, as well as the respect and reverence of the mate, she says exercise, movement, and massage, as well as spiritual work and prayer, meditation, and affirmations. To end violence within the love union and um, reduce uh, and eliminate low self-esteem, there is the life mission clear and in harmony, finding uh, how to make your life in ma and balance, understanding your life mission, understanding your goals, as well as self-love activities. For elimination or prevention of impotence and other sexually related imbalances within you, breath work, cultural healing and balance. Um, this is also going to help with seeing the body as a divine temple of love and beauty and um, opening up your sixth and seventh ch chakras, RE2, the spiritual gateway to the body temple. So for this final part, she's going to talk about the next generation ending violence on earth. Holistic lovemaking creates healthy parenting and healthy futures. Babies born of parents who make love under these conditions uh, and to manifest them under these conditions, um, have a greater opportunity to be disease free in the body, mind, and spirit. So, um, to she has here sacred woman exercises for to stimulate delightful, divine loving with your sacred mate. Squats, shoulder stands, resting with the legs at the forty-five degree angle or on a slant board, um, so like up against the wall. Fire breathing, one to 100 to 500 breaths. 
the cat asana and hatha yoga, doing African dancing, doing belly dancing, and also tightening and releasing the vaginal muscles with the tantric egg 10 to 15 minutes per day. Um, so that's the yoni egg or the, um, what's it called? Uh, you could use Benoit balls. I know that there's the, the two balls, the yoni balls. There's also just doing the squeezing. I call it punani lotties, right? A lot of people call it kegels after some white guy who got up with it after everybody else. Whatever. Uh, but yeah, doing all of those things are wonderful for building the womb area, for getting your body feeling nice and juicy. I would say just dancing, really, honestly. Just if you're trying to feel yourself, do some exercising, get the body moving, the womb feeling great. Do a little dancing, turn on some songs you like. The first one or two, you'll be stiff. By the end, you'll just be flailing around your room. Who cares if you look that great? It's about that feeling, that divine feminine feeling. It's that divine feeling of connection with yourself and connection with the energies, connection with your ancestors, with the music, with your partner, with what's to come. Uh, there, that's what that dancing really releases. I can't. I always feel sexy when I dance, or like usually by the end of it. Like I, I always dance way longer than I'm supposed to, making myself way tireder than I'm supposed to. And then like at the end, because uh, whenever I do my videos with you guys, I'll shut it off, and then I'll just be dancing along for like another couple hours, and I'll be like, I still have like a life to live, and now I'm exhausted and gonna be sore tomorrow. So, but it, you know, it makes you feel so good. I'm always ready to like, go find my husband and be like, oh, look at me, <laughs> you know? And he's just like, okay, like, you just danced around and now you're like, you're all sweaty in front, <laughs> in front of me. But it's so true, you know? It makes you feel so good. And like dancing for your partner is even better. They, they always enjoy it, you know? The, it will always get their attention eventually, <laughs> eventually. So, um, she says sexual orgasms intensified for a generation with your soulmate. So the way to a true orgasm is pure bliss comes from a pure diet. Mind altering herbs alone create only temporary bliss. So she recommends Damiana and saw palmetto berries, palmetto berries for effective for improving and strengthening the male organs and nerves. Avoid large doses and excessive use. Passion flower is an island fla favorite for um, both, I believe. Spearmint and peppermint are cures for frigidity in both. Echinacea is, stimulates sexual activity and has analgesic as well as immune stimulating properties. That's cool. I always knew echinacea was good for immunity, but I didn't know about sexual activity. That's pretty nice. I know that they have um, teas for that. So to, like, if you might, you might get a little immunity boost too while you're at it. Um, so we also have pure vanilla extract, but she says stay away from vanilla if you're trying to be celibate because it's famous for its aphrodisiac properties. Others for fire foods for stimulating passion, cayenne, ginger, red apples, cherries, beets, strawberries, raspberries, red or purple grapes, watermelon, garlic. Garlic. Yes, yes, garlic. I guess that's like more on the fire side, right? Yeah, cook it in there, get it going. All right, so how to dress for the rejuvenation chamber. She says waist beads, ankle bracelets, neck bracelets, manicure and pedicure with clear or colored polish, silk wraparound garments, dimmed lights, having silk scarf next to your lamp to place over it, and maybe it will change the color of the room as well as dim the lights a little drop of rose water or essential oil on the light bulb to let that diffuse naturally and incense so just like a spell right you're you're setting up the space for this room you're setting up all the different little details and bringing them together to create this moment to create this magic with each other and i think also just you know this is a good idea for having sacred beauty around your home um now my lights, are, see the sun is going down, and now your girl has to be all trying to keep up with it. All right, so the, um, this is also good for like sacred beauty just around your home, um, just feeling beautiful, looking beautiful, 
elegant feminine around your home wearing the jewelry wearing the um something very beautiful that's just a wrap around you know a silk robe uh i've seen those you know really beautiful ones with the fur there's the pretty ones that are you know just really fluffy there's so many house robes out there um some are more practical than others but they're definitely beautiful and some can be pulled out just for special occasions um and maybe they'll come to know what it is when you pull it out or maybe you just you're the type to always wear that type of stuff you're always liking to look elegant um but yes having those beautiful neck jewelry um, you know, wearing something very simple, but, you know, having those, that little bit of jewelry on you, your nails and your body done, uh, it, it's the little things. And, you know, I feel like, uh, you know, you, you always hear about guys complaining about like a oh, red lipstick and they take so long to get their hairs done, but guys, you know, they fall for red lips. They fall for a well-groomed woman. So, you know, the patriarchy doesn't know what it wants. It's, it's highly annoying, but you know what I mean? Like they're, they complain about one thing, but it's like if, if red lipstick didn't work, if high heels didn't work, if that dress didn't work, you know, they, they wouldn't use it on you. You're easy. You're simple. You know what I mean? You're complaining about it cause it works. <laughs> so the incense, you know, creating the smell, all this really wonderful stuff. Um, and yeah, and also, you know, uh, tweak this to be how your partner likes it. You know, don't just be putting on incense that you think is this like or that, but choose something that they will enjoy a scent also that that speaks to them. Uh, make sure that this is something about your partner specifically. These are just suggestions, right? More ways to keep your union beautiful and loving. Um, don't assume your partner knows what you want. Teach them gently. Um, demonstrate or guide to them what they, your needs are. Um, usually they want and need what you are, uh, you to show them. So it's easier on the union if they're not required to read your mind or your feelings. Um, pamper, serve and massage your partner. Encourage them to do the same for you by giving them gifts of flowers, fruits, candles, and books for conscientious, conscience, consciousness raising. So um, definitely, you know, invite them into the lifestyle, invite them into what you're doing, make it, you know, make it inviting, make it seem like something you're doing with them that you want them on this journey with you, that you want them participating with you. Because it may not be totally their thing, but you're their thing, right? So there is, you know, and then it also, for a lot of people, they can be feeling left behind when suddenly you're dressing a different way, talking a different way, acting different ways. Certain things are you're doing that you never used to do before. Making sure that you are talking to your partner, inviting them on this journey, showing that you're interested in them being along on this ride with you is important it is a, it is very important because they there's all sorts of things you can be thinking when it feels like your partner is moving along without you or leaving you for something else you know or you it feels like they're not that interested in you being there anymore um and all it can take is you know six to, to six or so months of that six to a year of that and uh it, like it can totally ruin a relationship so you know being very conscious about inviting the other person in and making it obvious that that's what you're doing. Allow them to advise you on how they can um, be encouraged for their needs, their qualities. Um, even if it's not always needed, you know, hearing their needs, hearing their ideas is a way to show that you're listening, that you're staying up to date on what they need. Um, Keep yourself beautiful in body and in spirit. Keep developing your separate gifts as a unique person to ensure growth and excitement in the union, right? Keeping somebody who's who's interesting, who has things going on, who has things going on that are, are personal or that are um, just kind of for you, you know what I mean? Uh, there are, obviously, we all have skills that our partner can't totally take over, and so those things can be nurtured and loved. And they can respect and love them, too. Um, eat your meals together. Travel together. Even mini trips just to take a walk to the park. Um, go out somewhere that's special just for both of you. One to four times a month. 
take evening walks together, sit on the porch at night, lie on grass together during the day, uh, keep in shape and exercise with each other, um, dress to impress each other, dress beautifully around the home and in bed, and don't allow yourselves to fall into a rut just because you now have each other. Um, speak words of love and appreciation often to keep the fires burning within your sacred union. Speak words of sweetness and use honeyed tones of endearment to them. Get away from the television. Constant TV viewing is a quick way to eat away at the beauty and creativity of your union. Um, that is one thing that we try to uphold is making sure we don't keep a TV in our room. And we also try to keep the computers out of the room too when we can. When we have a big enough home, we try to keep all that in the living room type space so that we do have a room in the house where we go and... The only thing that can be, like, turned on in here is, like, music. Um, don't argue. Try to discuss issues in tones of peace so you can remain clear enough to work out your challenges. Um, be aware of bobbing your head, hands on the hips, pointing fingers, arched backs. This behavior, which is both unnecessary and the opposite of sacred, um... Try breathing deeply instead, being prayerful, be calm that you can talk it out. Um, I think that in that case, I mean, obviously, there are times when you're both going to, you know, be animated. But being, I think, aware of what your body language is saying and where, how that, your body language can escalate things, take things to a place that they don't need to go, I think is the most important part here. Because, I mean, like, I don't know, sometimes your hand's going to be in your head. I, guys put their hands on their hips. Like, everybody puts their hands on their hips, like, when they're arguing. Um, but, you know, there are ways that your body language during an argument can take something that was here and, like, bring it all the way up here. It, it just because you're it seems way more aggressive or it seems like you're not taking it as seriously or it seems like you're being more disrespectful um due to your body language due to how you're acting and so that in that way as sacred woman we can think about how we're acting during arguments or discussions disagreements and finding ways through our own body language to dis de escalate or bring it to a place of understanding um because your body language is also important it's not just your sacred words it is like the sacred movements as well the quickest way to end a war and begin and begin the love dance is to perform the talking it out ritual which is over here we're going to talk about that in a minute um so she says um, here she talks to the man real quick and says, you know, give your, your spouse a face, clay facial, run them an herbal seaweed bath, massage her from head to toe, give her fresh juice and fruits in bed Saturday or Sunday morning, read poetry to her, dance for her, have fun, take her to interesting places, let the passion burn, all that really wonderful stuff. Um, and this is stuff that I think we can all do for each other, but I do think that women are more likely to do that type of stuff for their partner than men are inclined um so it's really important um so she has the talking it out ritual if you and oh uh yeah if you and your mate discuss uh, concerns first take a silent bath together oh must discuss concerns first take a silent bath together in two to four pounds of epsom salt or one pound of dead sea salt in a hot in hot water, add a few drops of rose water or pink rose petals, bubble bath in the bath water. Um, so you know, you're adding things for love, for rejuvenation of love. Make yourself a very deep, special, aromatic love bath with colorful petals, um, and beauty. Soak for twenty minutes or more and then pour more hot water into the tub over your heads, faces and backs before speaking. When your bath is done, you will find that all is well as you emerge from the tub. Take a warm shower together to wash, you know, all of that salt off and gently come out of the tub and towel each other dry gently. Next step is to massage each other's feet. It's important that the one receiving the massage is sitting up in a chair and the masseur is sitting on a, or masseuse is sitting on a low stool. Masseur or masseuse, place a towel in your lap and then massage your mate's feet one at a time with natural earth oils such as olive or almond, or simply have them lay flat on the bed to receive your foot massage. This entire ritual is done in silence. 
Allow your eyes, hands, and heart to speak for you. This is a sacred dance between mates, which increases your level of sanity, love, and bliss. If your mate is not advanced sufficiently due to anger or resentment or to fear, then you be the one to set them free and give love effortlessly. Watch and see, and in due time there will be reciprocity. For advanced couples of this divine way, here is a ritual that is done occasionally when you're, you need help from a heavenly mediator. Dress your king, dress your queen. Humble yourself to each other from head to toe, from brushing the hair to oiling the skin, from putting on our undergarments, wrapping their clothes around them, buttoning buttons, putting on socks, pulling up stockings. So here she's saying dress your partner. Um, dress them as somebody that you're honoring, a queen, a king. Um, put on their clothes for them. You know, dress, put, after you've massaged them all, put all these oils, put the socks on, button up each button of the shirt, wrap the skirt, or, you know, zip the zippers, however. This absolute service will stop all internal wars. Now, if you need to speak, your words will be spoken in pure harmony. So that is one of my absolute favorite rituals in this book, um, just because I think it really speaks to a lot of the essence of having a marriage. There is a lot of humbling that goes on. There's a lot of humility. And it is humbling, you know, to have to, you know, concede to stuff, to have to give up something that you wanted, to have to admit when you're wrong, all of those things. Um, but I just love this act of service, this act of washing the other person, rubbing them down, giving them the foot massage. Um, I mean, it, it does remind me a bit of, I, I remember, you know, there's that, that part of the Bible where Jesus gets his feet washed and there's several parts actually in the Bible where people get their feet washed and it's, it's, um, considered so symbolic because at the time people wore those sandals and they lived in a part of the world where animals were pooping in the streets. And so there's manure and dust and mud. And so your feet were generally disgusting. Okay. Like actually disgusting, actually had feces on them. Not just like oh, that person's got a crooked pinky toe, I hate feet, you know, not that. Like, they actually had gross feet. So the idea of getting on your knees, pouring a pitcher of water over that, and washing someone's feet and anointing them in perfume was very profound for the time. And unlike now where it's just superficial reasons, they grow hair on their feet, and therefore no one's feet should ever be seen. You know, it's a totally different mindset from now, but it is such a beautiful thing, and it makes you think about where their feet have taken them, how long they've been on their feet, what, you know, when was the last time they even had their feet massaged or cared for, you know, taking that time to really care for your partner and really serve them in a moment of serious anger, in a time of, of serious turmoil, is such a profound um, method. And this, I think, is also a beautiful ritual because it doesn't require much ingredients. It doesn't require doing, going all out, walking back and forth, taking a trip out to the crossroads, you know, turning around three times. It's, it's just at home, taking an agreement to to fast from speaking for a little while while you two serve each other and consider what you're going to say in those coming moments when you both completely dressed each other and you're sitting in front of each other completely fresh, rejuvenated, and ready to speak from the heart and speak from a place where you're both, you know, connected and you want you want for goodness to come of this conversation. You want for wellness to come from whatever is happening. So, um, and then also that service, it, it reminds you why you love that person, right? It, it, it does spark that softness so that you're willing to start the conversation from a place of wellness and love. So we're on page 352. We're going to finish off this part of the chapter with this sacred union seven-day transformative work. 
And next week, we have some stuff to discuss for the final part of this chapter, Sacred Union, from the five love languages. I have a little bit to read to you from there. So we're going to go on from here. This is what we're doing for the last leg of the month. We have the most important relationship on earth is your relationship with your inner self in the inner marriage between your masculine and feminine energies. The extent to which you heal yourself and come to union within is the extent to which you will be able to heal all your external relationships. As you learn to focus less on the outer world and enter into your inner environment, the world around you will improve. Establishing a strong foundation of love, honor, and compassion for all aspects of your inner sacred self will also help you establish a strong, intimate relationship with your life partner. So she says, extend your use of the love progress charts in sacred union and extend it to include, evaluate, and heal all your relationships that need strengthening, change, or release. Write down 10 of the most important qualities you want to manifest in intimate relationships in order to create the union, that union and a life of divine right order. Examine your past four intimate unions and reflect on the presence or absence of these qualities. Identify four sacred unions from your past that need spiritual purification. As you do your altar work, place symbols of these unions on your altar and practice the art of forgiveness of self and others so that you spiritually cleanse your heart in all disharmonious conditions. If you are not yet ready to forgive, still place these symbols of these intimate relationships on your altar and let Asar and Ost begin to soften your feelings of resentment, judgment, and anger. Don't be erratic and jump into a new relationship without cleansing out old toxic habits that created your previous poisonous unions. Perform purification rites and activate them regularly through fasting, eating natural foods, taking enemas, and colonics, and spiritual baths, journal work, prayer work, affirmations, and purification of your environment at home and work. Perform seven-day prayer altar work for sacred union. Place an image of the mother, father, or an aspiring loving couple on your altar in a beautiful frame. Write the creator and your parents a love letter about your understanding of their union and your gratitude for the union that created your life. Read this out loud every new moon. Explore the nature of your parents' union honestly. What was positive in their intimate relationship? What was negative? What needs to be purified? What needs to be healed? What energetic inheritance have you carried from their union into your intimate relationships? Even if you don't feel the words at the time, once you come to grips with this foundational relationship in your life, that of your parents, the letter will heal your heart. Be healing the roots of this union. All other By healing the roots of this union, all other unions in your life will be healed and will prosper and give you hotep. So I do think that's very beautiful to go to the very beginning of the sacred union that created you and addressing what was good, what was bad, what 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 came of it, um, coming to peace with it, coming to peace with what you internalized and learned from that as a child that now you're recognizing isn't exactly true or isn't exactly healthy. It was just, you know, a unique situation of your own upbringing or circumstance. So, um... List all past intimate relationships from the first childhood crush forward to to the present. And as you list the relationships, identify core themes. For example, this is what I brought to this relationship. This is what my partner brought. This is what we created together. Um, even this is why for, you know, your very first crush, maybe in like the first grade. But, you know, maybe even identifying common themes throughout some of your first earliest crushes, what that said about you, what that said about your environment, what you'd internalized about yourself, that type of thing. Um, let's see. She also said, write a love letter, a thank you letter, or a letter of forgiveness to those in your life who you need to relate to so that you can help create more wholesome encounters. If the other person has died or has vanished out of your life, then just write the letter and burn it with a little sage or other cleanser to begin to release the vibrate, vibratory pain or stagnant energies of your past. 
During your morning meditation and prayers, send love, light, and forgiveness to those you're sending those letters to or, you know, who are on your intimate relationship list. Self-worth and self-love must be in place within you in order to establish your divine relationships. It's not about a relationship with him or her. It's about a relationship with yourself. Os, the guardian of sacred union, teaches us that loving union with self is the foundation for all other unions in our life. As you do your journal work, ask yourself what it would take to establish a healthy union with yourself. We also have placing a family tree on your altar that diagrams the different sacred unions that have been in your family. Marriages of body, mind, spirit, and your immediate and extended family. Meditate on these sacred ancestral unions and ask for guidance and inner light. If you don't know anybody, any sacred unions from your family, nobody was married, or um, you don't know anybody's names, find a sacred union, that a healthy sacred union, right? Don't, um, and hopefully ancestral um or elders and you know use use those i i mean it should be ancestral because you're gonna she recommends putting it on the ancestral altar so it should be ancestral if you're putting it on the altar um but you know asking for their energy asking for their guidance right um is really important and i would recommend the people at the beginning of her book but she wrote this a long time ago so we got we got a lot of we got some people who maybe um maybe shouldn't be called on I guess or you know who who and then a couple of them I don't even know who's the elder I mean who's the ancestor I guess it would be Isis Isis and Ost uh or Isis and Osiris um would be the ones who would be the ancestors kind of of this chapter that she recommends um but you know finding other ones finding famous older couples or other very beautiful couples who who have been famous throughout black history would be uh, another way that you could do that instead. And, you know, asking them for guidance and inner light or just asking, um, putting up a picture of some random ancestors and just talking with your ancestral spirits and spirit guides generally to help you with um, your relationship. Because there, there have been a lot of toxic relationships in the past, but there has been love. There has been long, beautiful um, faithful, you know, n- non-stressful and very healing relationships in the black community in the past, and that shouldn't be ignored or pretend that that never happened because it definitely did. There were people who, you know, stayed with their children, took care of the family, never cheated on their wife, all sorts of wonderful, you know, companionships occurred in the last couple hundred years. So, um, those can also be honored and called upon to help you with your sacred union. Finally, she has daily at sunrise, you and your mate should come together to perform and to share your journal work, to support one another and focusing on the work of strengthening and unfolding sacred union. So um, having them wake up between 4 and 6 a.m. to do a bath, to do journal work, to do yoga, to pray, to meditate, to do something, um especially if you're struggling or you're trying to take your relationship to another level, um, taking that time in the morning to come together and just spend a little bit of time on your relationship. So it doesn't have to be that full hours. Maybe you're, you're like talking, you, you only want to do it for like 45 minutes, but even spending 10 minutes when you only have 10 minutes is a beautiful way to keep putting, keeping your uh, relationship to the forefront, making, taking care of your relationship a habit taking care of this union a habit that you're building every day with each other so she says therefore thereafter to maintain the union at a high level commit to performing this spiritual work every week vow not to get so busy in the world that you forget the importance of creating the sacred union on a regular basis so you both may be fulfilled so creating and maintaining your sacred union as a couple is so vitally important so our um, sacred union commitment says I commit myself to establishing and continuing the wisdom of Ost and the power of sacred union in all areas of my life so um, 
Yes, that is, I mean, that gives you a lot to do, especially if you, you know, have relationships that you need to be healing from your past, unions that you need to be addressing from your past, looking at um, studying from your past, and then also if you have a relationship now that you're trying to heal, take to another level, implement some new things in, um, transition to um, this type of lifestyle, I hope you got some ideas for what to do this week. And I'll be seeing you next Monday um, to finish off the Sacred Union Gateway. And we will start up with Nefer Atum, the um, Initiation Gateway, Sacred Lotus Initiation Gateway 9 is coming up uh, in October. So I'm so excited about that. Um, we'll have a lot to talk about, I know. So until then, um, I'll see you all next week. For the end of sacred union may your spirit guides and ancestors be with you at every crossroads